Hello and welcome to the Photography Channel. I'm Nigel Cooper and today I'm going to be giving you a quick tutorial on Affinity Photo. Now don't worry, I'm going to get rid of this picture of me in a minute. I've got to admit I'm not a big fan of people that leave this little picture-in-picture picture of themselves down at the bottom of the screen when giving software tutorials. I find it distracting, it gets in the way, and it usually covers up something in the software that you're trying to see anyway. And at the end of the day, why does anybody need to see the person's face when they're doing a tutorial on software? It all seems rather silly and pointless. Um, I just wanted to have this open just so I can say hi, here I am, to introduce myself and to explain what this tutorial is going to be about. So this tutorial is on the assumption that you are a total beginner to photo editing and it's also going to assume that you are not shooting in JPEG mode in your camera and that you're shooting in RAW um, because if you're shooting in JPEG the camera throws away and discards a lot of the photo information and it normally applies some sort of photo profile to boost the colors and contrast and so on and so forth. So in your camera you want to set that to shoot in RAW now what this means is it means that the camera is retaining every single bit of detail and information especially in the highlights and in the dark areas it doesn't discard or throw anything away or compress it which means you've got a lot more scope for editing in a program like affinity photo now you can edit jpeg images but you just can't do very much with them because so much information has already been discarded by the camera you can't bring highlights back and you can't basically change sliders too much before the image starts to break up so let me get rid of this without further ado um, now this is also going to assume that you have already been to the affinity photo website and you've downloaded affinity photo for either mac or windows um, i'm not going to concentrate on the ipad version here um, this is for the desktop version of mac or windows i'm also going to assume that you've downloaded your raw files from your camera's card, SD card or wherever it may be and you've basically put them onto a file on your computer's hard drive. So when you open Affinity Photo this is what you're going to be presented with and the first thing we're going to do is click file, we're going to go down to open and we're going to find those raw images that you basically saved from your camera's card. Now I've got a couple of raw images here that was shot on my Sony a7 III. They've got the file extension ARW. If you're shooting on Canon, it would be CR2. Uh, Nikon have got a different file extension, but Affinity Photo will open most RAW files from most camera formats. So I'm going to select these two here and open them up. Um, they will be loaded into Affinity Photo. Of course, they're RAW files. It'll take a few seconds. And as you can see, we have them both here in these two tabs. Now I'm also going to quickly just go back to open and bring in another three images here which I'm going to need for demonstration purposes. So let me just bring these in. So we have that one there. Uh, we've got a cat. Yes we do. And we should have a bear there and our grey card. So um, the reason I wanted to bring these in is just to demonstrate the histogram. So we've got the images in. This is the first raw image that we brought in. Um, now what I'm going to do, if I have a look at the exposure of this, I can see it's a little bit underexposed, maybe by about a stop and a half. And this is where this histogram comes into play. Now, a lot of photographers basically claim that when it comes to the histogram, you want to aim for a nice mountain in the middle like this, a nice arc here with not much at the right and not much at the edge. Now if I push this exposure slider up and down, if I move it to the right, it will bunch all those pixels and move them across to the right further and then we can end up with um, a mountain shape that's more to the right. If I push it too far, all those pixels will get pushed over to the right hand edge and as you can see the picture gets blown out. And if I click up here on this button which is called clipped highlights, any areas that are overexposed will show up in red. So if I basically just double click that button to bring it back to the middle, they disappear. Now as I'm dragging this up, you can see that that looks about fine there because we've got that more centralized. But if I was to keep going, eventually parts of red will start to show up. And that's what this highlight button does here. If you turn it off, you won't see them, but it's a good idea to have it turned on just while you're making this exposure adjustment. So let me just reset that for a minute and close that. Now, the reason this mountain in the middle thing just doesn't work on every image, again, if I do it on this one, I can bring that up to the right a little bit. That is kind of okay. So everything's kind of bunched more centrally. 
Um, but let me just show you something else for a second here with these images of the bear. If I start off with this one, you know, we've got the white bear against the white snow. Now, if I click on the um, develop persona and we have a look here at the histogram, we can see that all this is bunched up to the right. Now, if I was to grab the exposure slider and bring that all down to the middle, which is where people say it should be in a nice mountain in the middle, you can see the image is now underexposed and it's not correct. Whereas that is correct, um, but the reason everything's bunched up to the right here is because there's a lot of white pixels in this image. Same for the cat. Um, again, if I click on the develop persona and we have a look here at the histogram, there's a lot of black in this image, the black background and the black cat. So naturally, there's a lot of black pixels and they're just all bunched up there because essentially all the histogram is telling you is the luminosity of all those pixels and where they are. Again, I can't drag this up to put all those into the middle, otherwise it just destroys the image. So um, this is correct, and that is how the histogram will look with low-key photographs or with high-key photographs like this. They will be stacked further to the right. Um, and just to prove this, if I click on this grey card image and then click the develop persona and have a look at it, all we have here is this thin streak of pixels that are all the same colour in the middle because photographers call this 18% grey because it's halfway between black and white. If I grab the exposure and start to make that darker, you will see that line comes down and eventually it will just turn black. Whereas if I go to the right, eventually it will turn white but it is a grey card, so it would be left in the middle. But that diagram there in the histogram, coupled with this one of the bear, with all the pixels stacked to the right because it's a bright image, or this low-key image, they're all stacked to the left. So if I go to the windmill um, or the portrait, these are different. There's a lot more mid-tones in these images. Oops, let me just zoom out again there. So the pixels are stacked in a slightly different way. So let me just close this one. I'm not going to need it or that or the grey card anymore. So let's concentrate first on editing this windmill shot. So again, I can see it's a little bit underexposed. So I'm going to bring the exposure up a little bit and move these pixels away from the left hand edge. And this little mountain of pixels here, I'm just going to push them further towards the right hand edge. But I don't want to push them past it, otherwise it will overexpose. And I'm just going to turn on this highlight clipping warning indicator. So if I do push it too far, I will see that red start to come up. But realistically, I'm just going to push them slightly to about there. So I don't want to push those right ones off the edge. Um, and I can see here from my clipping, which I can now turn off, that no red came up. So now we've got the exposure set fine. The only other thing I'm going to adjust in here is the clarity slider. Um, if I turn this all the way up, it just increased the contrast in finite little areas, every little tiny edge, um, it just boosts the contrast on it to basically give the image more clarity. Likewise, if I drag it all the way to the left, it actually takes it away and makes it smoother. So I'm just going to put that to the middle and zoom in a little bit here just to give you more of an idea as to what this is doing. So if we look at this foliage here and the wood, if I drag this all the way to the right, you can see that suddenly that all pops. Whereas if I drag it all the way to the left, then it's basically going softer. So if I just double click this little button to basically reset it, I'm just going to bring it up about 20% there. Now if I zoom out and turn this on and off, you'll see the difference that makes. It's only subtle. If you look in the sky at the clouds and I turn it on, we get that little boost of uh, sharpness and clarity. And when it's off, it goes away. So um, I would not recommend going more than 30% on that. If I bring it up to um, about 30% there and turn it off, you'll see that's a bit more of a drastic effect because if you start to go too far up, then it just starts to look unnatural. Um, so, you know, it's good to err on the side of caution with this stuff. So I'm going to bring that down to about 20, 25, 26% and that's good. So we've added a little bit of clarity just to sharpen the image up a little bit and give it more definition. We've set our exposure. So now we can actually go over and click this develop button on the top left. Now, when I click that, 
Affinity Photo is going to do its thing in the background and apply those settings to the RAW file so that we end up here, which is what Affinity Photo call the photo persona or what I call the photo window. So um, now we're here, we can actually do a few more edits. So over here on the right hand side, we have our layers and adjustments. These are the two tabs that we're going to be working on most of the time. So in here, there's not much I have to touch. You can actually click on some of these things and see what's in them and see what they do. Uh, we got various things for color, for example, if I click on the default color here, um, this is where we can adjust the, you know, the color, the saturation going from black and white to increase in the color. Um, I'm just going to close that. You've got some here that are presets uh, for many things. Now, one thing I do like to do is to add what's called a curve. Um, now, in the brightness and contrast, for example, if I click in here, we've got a contrast slider where you can decrease the contrast or increase the contrast. So if I drag that right, right up, it's going to make it very contrasty. Um, but I don't actually like to use the contrast slider. I actually prefer to use the curves uh, because this does a better job and it does it in a more accurate way and a better way, in my opinion. Um, now, how the curves works, again, I'm not going to go into uh, great detail on this. Type into YouTube using curves in Affinity Photo or using curves in um, Capture One or, or using curves in photo editing, and you can basically watch three or four tutorials on it. But basically, what you will do about 98% of the time is draw in what's called an S curve uh, and because it looks like the letter S. So we basically click and make points on this line here. And I like to click on this intersecting se section here and this one here. So uh, we have this sort of uh, big square box in the middle and we're basically coming in about 25% here and about 25% here with about a 50% blank area in the right. And then, when the, and then we're going to click on this one and just drag it up a little bit and we're going to click this one and drag it down a little bit. Now if I exaggerate that you can basically see why it's called an S curve because it looks like the letter S. Now it's important that you draw the S the right way around and not the wrong way around like some three-year-olds might for example like this because this way we're going to be pushing the dark areas and making them brighter and we're going to be taking the bright areas and making them darker which we don't want because that just yields a wishy-washy image. So I'm going to click reset and again this is what we want to be doing but we don't want to be going too far we just want to be making this subtle so just a little bit like this and if I click on the opacity slider and bring it down to zero that takes out the effect and you can see the difference there that's without and that's with without and with it just adds a little bit of contrast now basically over here on the right hand side as you know from the histogram these are the bright areas and over here on the left are the dark areas so this is naturally bringing the dark areas down and this one here is basically affecting the white areas and bringing those up. So this is just a gentle little S curve just to give a little bit of contrast by bringing the brightness up a little while bringing the darker areas down a little just to give it punch. Um, so that's the curves. That's something else you'll want to put in. Um, so I'm just going to go to this HSL one here and click on the default one because this doesn't do anything until you actually start dragging things around. Now we have a saturation shift here. If I drag it to the left, it makes the image black and white. If I drag it further up, it just intensifies the colors way more. When it comes to saturation, um, again, err on the side of caution. If you do this, it's going to look ridiculously unnatural. Um, I usually find somewhere between 8 and about 18% is a good place to be. If I bring it to about there, 17, click on this and turn it off, you can see the difference before and after. Now, I'm just going to reset this by double clicking that button because there's something else you can do in here. We have got a picker. So if I only wanted to affect the blue in the sky and leave all the green, I would basically click blue because that's the nearest to the blue sky, then click picker and then go and choose an area of blue like there, for example, and you can see that it's selected that blue area. Now, if I desaturate that, it's just going to turn the sky black and white and it's going to leave everything else. So now I can adjust the sky on its own without adjusting the green. So if I want to intensify the sky, I can actually make it a richer blue, like about let's just exaggerate it for a minute to there and then if I turn that off you'll see that it's only affecting the sky so I'm going to bring that down to about 
there, about 22%. That's nice and subtle. Again, if I turn it off and on, you can see it's had just a subtle change there. Um, but it just gives that sky much more punch. So that's all we're going to do there. Now, you might want to use the crop tool because I feel in this image there's too much green foliage down the bottom. So over here on the left, if we click on this crop tool here, it will bring up these grids that you can either grab any of these handles at the top there. Um, let me just undo that. Or this right one to bring it in there. Um, or the side ones. Now, I don't like to make... Um, what I call weird crops. So some people just grab these handles and they just sort of drag them around. They think, okay, I'll have that one there and I'll have that there and that's fine. And they'll hit return on the keyboard. And they end up with what's called, what I like to call just a strange um, non-industry standard crop. So what I do is I click the crop tool. Now, because I want this image to be square, if you look up here on the left, we've got the pixel count. So it's telling you here that it's 4,020 four pixels wide by 6024 pixels high and if I grab this bottom handle and start to drag it up to about there because I want to maintain the bottom of that fence post um, we can see that it's 4024 by 44 um, double o, so it's not quite square it's actually become something a little bit weird so rather than me just trying to aim to get that square I can just double click that a number there, copy it, and then double click this and paste it into there. And then when I click the left one, it will basically shift that and make it perfectly square. Um, and then I can just sort of drag that to where I want it to be for the final image. And then when I hit return on the keyboard, that is the square crop. Now, there's something else I want to show you while I'm in here because um, I don't know if you can see this, but just here we've got this strange little... Um, dark area in the sky if you can see that there um, it's only quite small so I'm going to keep this quite large to show you how to get rid of it uh, because Affinity Photo has got this rather clever tool over here called the in painting brush tool so it's um, it's about five or six up from the bottom you just click on that and hold it and bring up the in painting brush tool now what this does um, and the first thing you have to do is because we've made some adjustments over here on the right we've got to click on our layers and then we've got to go down here and we've got to click our background layer you've actually got to have the pixel or photographic layer selected to be able to make any adjustments to it because if one of these um, other things is selected then we're not going to be able to make any adjustments to the picture so you've got to select the image um, the pixel layer here now what the in painting brush tool does is as I um, paint over this I'm going to just quickly paint over this to show you what happens it brings up this red and as I paint over that when I let go of the mouse Affinity Photo is going to delete everything from within the red area and replace it with pixels that are surrounding it so I will let go and it's taken some of the cloud area from around the area and it's in painted them in there that's what's just happened now over here we've got another little spec here so what I can use using the bracket keys on the keyboard um, you can push the right one to make this circle bigger or the left one to make it smaller but it only has to be small for this so I'm just going to make it that size and then just I don't have to click and drag like that um, I'm just going to undo that because it's only a spot I can just click it and then it fixes it for me automatically now just as a wild exaggeration um, if I just make that circle a little bit bigger here and click and drag down here and down there I'm just going to paint over this stuff here go over that and over here go over there come back to there I'm just going to show you what this does uh, there we go when I let go at the top here you can see it's doing its thing it's doing its algorithms and it's basically painted those out now it doesn't always do a great job as you can see it's left a few scraggly bits behind here but I can just paint over that one again and I can paint over that little bit there and maybe paint over there just to get that to do a better job and there we go and finish maybe there's a little bit as well and done so that's basically what the in painting brush tool does let me just sort of paint over here a bit to get rid of that see if I can do a better job there there we go so um, that was a bit of a wild one so I'll just undo those just so you can um, see what it did so I'm going to give you another example of the in, in painting brush shortly so um, that is basically it for the windmill so um, 
Let me now move over to this portrait shot and do a few more basic edits for this one because we all take portrait shots. Um, this is just going to be a typical sort of outdoor landscapey thing and what you can do with it. Uh, now for a portrait shot just really quickly. Again, the exposure, I'm just going to push the exposure up a little bit because we can see this image is a bit dark. So by grabbing the exposure slider, watching the histogram and watching those pixels shift while looking at the image at the same time, and we can turn on this clipped highlights indicator and we can see that nothing's clipping. If I continue to push it too far, we can see bits of red starting to come into all the blown out areas that are too bright. So I'm basically going to bring that back down to about there. That's looking good. And then I can turn off the clipped highlight indicator because it's no longer needed. Um, now for the clarity, I'm just going to zoom in and show you something here because when it comes to portraits, you don't necessarily want to add clarity because if you add clarity, this is what happens. So if I drag it all the way up, then suddenly you can see every little bit of detail which you don't want. So I'm just going to double click that to put it back. Likewise, if we drag the clarity slider to the left, it's going to soften out the skin. So again, if I double click it to put it back to the middle, you can see that it's brought that detail in a bit. And if I drag it to the left, it smooths things out. So with the clarity slider, with portraiture, you don't necessarily want to go dragging it up to bring in extra sharpness because it just starts to show everything up. So what I'm actually going to do here, I'm actually going to drag it down um, about 50%, uh, not minus 100, but about minus 50 like that, just to give a nice, soft, sort of more romantic look to this image. Um, so that's about it for that one. So now we've got the exposure set and we've adjusted the clarity. I can click on develop and wait for Affinity Photo to apply those settings so we will end up in the photo persona where we can do some basic edits. Okay, so there we are. We're now in the photo persona. So if I now click on the adjustments tab here, we can go through here and make a few adjustments. Um, I'm gonna have a little look at the curves in here. Uh, because I could give this a mild S curve just to give it a little bit of punch. Again, bring up the brightness a little bit and bring down the dark ones a little bit there to the left. Again, if I turn that off and on, you can see that it's just a subtle difference and just adds a little bit of contrast. So um, what we're also going to do in here is just remove a few of the little blemishes off the face. After all, it's a portrait shot and there's a few different ways of doing this. Over on the left here, um, before we were in the in-painting brush tool. Now I can use this if I make this tool a little bit smaller. Don't forget to always go back to the layers and to select the pixel layer, the main photograph. Um, what we can now do is if I paint over, say, this little red area here like that and let go, um, it will do a good job of in-painting it. That's one way of doing this. And again, I can do it down here. I can click on that. I can click there on these little sort of uh, birth marker type things, if you like, to get rid of them that way. But I'm just going to undo these and put these back and show you one other way of doing it. So over here on the left, we do have something called a blemish removal tool. Now, I'm just going to use the uh, bracket keys on the keyboard to make this a little bit bigger, just to give you an idea as to what it does. Now, if I want to get rid of this little red bit here, I would simply get my circle the right size and click on it. And then as I drag away, it's basically going to find another area of skin. Now, if I drag over the pupil there, for example, you can see it's actually put the eye there. And as I move around, it's going to different parts of the eye. It's going to eyelashes there. So if I let go, now we have this eye there, which we don't want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click. And then as I move the mouse away, where the mouse is now, it's going to basically put that little bit of skin over the top of the other one. So I wouldn't want to go there, for example, because you can see that that doesn't match up. We do. We probably want to go to about here. That's not looking too bad. Uh, let me just try down here, perhaps a bit. Yeah, there. And then I'll let go. And that has got rid of it. Um, similar for here. You know, if, if I just zoom in a little bit more, uh, we have this little mark here. I can click on that and then I can basically move down here and choose this section. Um, same for this little bit here. I can click there and drag away and maybe use a section from there instead. Um, now I'll do the in-painting brush just to show you how that would work. So I choose the in-painting brush tool here. 
and again I can just click once and it will impaint. Um, again don't forget to use your bracket tools to get that nice and small to match the size of whatever it is that you're clicking over. Um, I'm just going to paint down over that one. Um, click on that one, that one and maybe just paint over that a little bit and that one. Um, click a few here, there we go, just to get some of these out, maybe that line there. Um, if I come up to the top here we have this little pimply bit there. Um, if I make this a little bit smaller I can actually even draw out some of these lines. If I draw out there that's going to get rid of that one. If I draw over that one the same thing and maybe these two here uh, da, 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 there. and that one there and I could maybe even do that one there a little bit. There we go. Um, I think we're good on that. So that's basically done a little bit of, um, should we say, blemish removal. And we're pretty much good to go on this. So now we're going to export these images. So um, I'm just going to bring up this little um, text document here of information that I got because I did a little bit of research. Um, so I'm going to show you how to export these images for um, Instagram, Facebook, or if you're a photographer and you've got a portfolio, or even for print. Um, most of us upload our photographs to social media like Facebook or Instagram. So what we do is we go to, um, you have actually got on the right here, you've got something called the export persona, which I don't like to use. Uh, when you click it, um, you basically have this box come up here with all these various drop down things. So instead of using that, um, what I like to do is I just like to click on file and export um, because all that information we had over here a minute ago, now we just have it here instead. Um, but this is just a more presentable way of doing it. You've got your various file formats, your TIFFs and PDFs and JPEGs. And then underneath, this is just much easier to read. So if I bring this up again, if you're going to basically export an image for Facebook, for example, Facebook likes images to be 1200 pixels along the longest edge or 1080 pixels by 1080 pixels square. Um, Instagram likes the images to be 1350 pixels along the longest edge if it's a portrait shot like this, for example, or 1080 by 1080 pixels square. So in this instance, if we're going to export for Facebook, where we have the size here, uh, we can see that it's 4024 pixels wide and 6024 high. So that's going to be too big and it's going to produce a file size that's uh, unnecessarily large as well. So if I just double click on this one and type in 1200, then when I click on the left one, it will automatically put the width to 802 pixels to match the height of 1200 pixels so that, so that we're going to retain um, this format. That is because that padlock is clicked in the middle. Now, if you unclick it, I could basically type in something else here, but then the picture will skew up and it won't match. So leave that padlock um, clicked there. We're going to keep JPEG best quality. We're not going to basically um, change it to anything else. Uh, if you change it to medium quality, the slider here changes to 45. High quality, it's 85. And best quality, it's 100. But what I am going to do is I'm going to basically bring it down to 95 because I found that the difference between 100 and 95 is nothing. It's nothing that you can see in the image no matter how close you look. However, the file size will drop. So for this same image, for example, um, if the file size was going to be one and a half megabytes at 100, if I bring it down to 95, then it's going to basically change that file size and bring it down to less than half a megabyte. So it shrinks the file size considerably um, by more than half, but you can't actually see the image quality difference. So we're going to have that quality slider at 95. If you bring it down to 85 or below, then you start to see JPEG artifacting and the image quality start to get a little bit blocky. If you bring it right down, then the image quality will just look hideous. So 95 is where you want to be because there's no difference between that and 100. Nothing that you can really see anyway. Even when you look really hard, it's very hard to see anything, but the file size just is a lot smaller. So that's how you set this here for Facebook. And then you sim simply click export. And um, we're just going to call this uh, Danny portrait and export that to the desktop. And that's it. Now, um, if we look at these other sizes, it's a similar thing. Um, if I just go to File and Export, 
um, bring this back up again. If we want to export a shot for Instagram, we can basically just double click that and change that to 1350. And then we click on the left one, it will automatically match the width accordingly. Again, we're just going to leave this at best quality JPEG. Uh, sorry, 95. I'm going to bring that down. When you change this, then the, the preset there disappears because you've modified it and we can just export it again accordingly. Um, however, let me just cancel this and show you how to export for print. So, for example, if you're going to be printing with a company such as Photobox um, or Jessup's, for example, where you just upload JPEGs, um, companies like Jessup's and Photobox, they basically like you to upload JPEG images. Likewise, if you're going to basically pop along to uh, Boots um, with, with your uh, images on a flash stick, then again, um, they like to have JPEG images for those machines. So we're going to stick to JPEG here. Uh, the only difference is when it comes to printing, regardless of the size, whether it's 5, 7, 10, 8 or larger prints up to 20 by 30, for example, we're not going to adjust the pixel size here. You're going to want to leave that to maintain the best possible quality. And the slider, you want that at 100% for best quality JPEG also. So that is how you're going to have these settings. If you're going to send them off to print um, via the Internet or take them to your local chemist, Again, we just click export and I'll call this Danny for print and click save. And that's pretty much it. So there we are. That was a, a quick introduction and walkthrough of how to get your photos into and out of Affinity Photo. You've been watching the photography channel. I'm Nigel Cooper. I hope you got something from this. And don't forget that when you're actually editing in here to have a little click around through some of these other adjustments um, and see what they do. You can just sort of click on all these and do various things. So do click around and experiment. But I just wanted to basically show you the basics so you could get the raw image in, do a basic edit on it and export it and have it look good. Okay, that's it. Thanks for stopping by and I hope to see you again real soon.